Well, well, well. What have we got here then? A white stipe that's host to remnants of a partial veil, that frilly membranous skirt attached to the stipe, an egg-like bulbous sac from which the fungi grows out of, an olive yellowy coloured cap, white gills on the underside of the cap. Well, slap me twice and take me to me mother. That's the goddamn death cap. Amanita phylloides. The deadliest, most potently toxic fungi in the world. The evil, sinister mascot of mycology. Kill you fucking dead, slowly and painfully and agonizingly in two days of your money back. You've heard me bang on about them before, but here's one in the flesh, just lounging about. It's like staring down the barrel of a loaded gun, although not as immediately threatening. But it's exciting in that I can share this with you. And what's especially exciting about this death cap is that this is the most developed death cap that I've come across. Up until now, the death caps that I've come across have been quite immature, little knobbly, stumply things. Which is how we tend to think of death caps, right? Those potent little clumps of agony, suffering and eventual death. But these do indeed grow and expand and unravel just like every other ajaric. But before we talk about death caps, I think it's worth having a formal introduction to fungal anatomy and mycological terminology because death caps and amanitas in general have some very special features with nice technical terms. And it's all well and good just pointing to stuff and saying blah 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 that's what that does, that's what this does. It's worth knowing exactly what these special features are. What is their purpose? How did they get there? So, right, call this Mycology 101. Fungal anatomy and taxonomy. It's worth having a cup of tea. I do recommend you get one. Oh, holy f oh, fucking hell. Oh, sat on a goddamn larynx cone. Those pesky buggers. Oh, that hurt. <clears throat> anyway, right, oh, take a breath, man. Fungi come in many different shapes and sizes, both cosmetic differences and anatomical differences. So each individual genus of fungi is designated to a specific group based on anatomical features. A few major groups are number one, ajarix, two, bullets, three, gasteroids, and four, polypores. They're arguably the most common groups of fungi out here in the forest. There are many more, but those are the four major ones. For example, Gasteroids are the ball fungi. Their anatomy consists of a gleba and a peridium. They're your stink horns, they're your earth balls, your puff balls. They are all members of the gasteroid group. Sounds cool, right? Gasteroid. It's like meet your polypores are your brackets, your daedalopsis, your fomfermentarius, your piptoporus betulinus. Tree dwelling fungi with no stipe. Their conch grows directly off the substrate from their mycelium, which is their root network. Bullets are your short and stumpy, your fat and chody, ground-dwelling fungi that have pores on the underside of their cap. And the jarics are your typical thinner-stemmed, ground-dwelling fungi that have gills on the underside of their cap. Ajarics are the group we'll focus on today, because death caps are ajarics. Now. For a fungi to be classified as an ajaric, it must have three specific characteristics. Number one, it must have a cap. The technical mycological term for the cap is the pileus. Sounds nice, it rolls off the tongue. Pileus. The second feature it must possess is gills on the underside of the cap. And the technical term for the gills is lamellae. It sounds nice, it sounds French. And its third and final feature, it must have a stipe that is clearly differentiated from the cap. The stipe is the technical term for the stem. These are the three characteristics or taxonomical features that fungi must possess in order for them to be considered an ajaric. What are the special features, you ask? Just can't go throwing the word special around so hazardously. Some ajarics have additional anatomical features. One special feature that ajarics sometimes possess is that thin tissue-like membrane that dangles off the stipe. This is known as the ring, or the skirt, depending on how it looks. They come in different shapes and sizes. 
death caps have a skirt and the technical term for that skirt is the annulus or annulus. It sounds Egyptian, it's memorable. But where does it come from? Why is that a feature? What is its purpose? The annulus is a remnant of the partial veil. What is the partial veil? When some Ajariks are young and immature, they'll have a thin membrane covering and protecting the underside of the cap. It protects the lamellae. The lamellae is the reproductive organ, it's what produces the spores, so it's an important feature that must be protected. That is the partial veil. But when the fungi matures and the cap starts to open out and expand, it will stretch and tear that protective membrane. <coughs> right, take a breather. <gasps> it will shed that protective membrane and leave it behind on the stipe, which is henceforth known as the annulus a remnant of the partial veil. The second special feature that most Amanitas possess is the bulbous sac at the base of the stipe. That is known as the vulva, which is a curious thing. Might raise a few eyebrows. It's spelt with an O, not a U. This vulva is known as a remnant of the universal veil. What is a universal veil? Some Ajarix, particularly the Amanitas, start off their life in a little egg-like structure. A protective barrier, a veil that universally covers the developing fungi. Compare it to a typical chicken egg. The yolk is the developing fungus and the egg whites are the universal veil. That yolk will develop into a chicken and hatch out of the veil, if you will. It's a protective structure. So once the fungus has developed its basic anatomy, it will break out of the universal veil. It will push upwards out of that little egg and leaves it behind. So henceforth, from that point, the universal veil is known as the vulva. It just appears as a little sac at the base of the stipe. Those are the special features that a deaf cat possesses, an annulus and a vulva. And now you know what both of them do and where they came from. GG! And another little bonus piece of info. The scales that you see on Amanita muscaria, for example, the little white specks on the pileus, those too are remnants of the universal veil. When Amanita muscaria breaks out of its veil, sometimes parts of the veil will get stuck to the top of the cap and they get dragged upwards with the fungi as it continues to grow and expand. And what's left a little flex which are known as scales or warts. And they're only superficially stuck to the fungi, so they are prone to being washed off or weathered off by strong winds and rain. So that's something you have to look out for. The root network of fungi is known as the mycelium. It is a network of individual hypha, plural hyphae, which collectively is known as the mycelium or mycelial network. And the substrate is a nice technical term for the surface from which the fungi grows out of. So the substrate of Ajarix are the earth, typically, and the substrate of polypores are trees. Easy, right? Ugh, there we go. That is basic fungal anatomy of Ajarix. I have an image of three different death caps in different stages of development. The one on the left, I believe, is the stage of maturity that my death cap right here is in. Two is a little babby death cap freshly emerged from its veil and three is a fully mature death cap. I want you to take note of the annulus on number three. It's very significant and immediately noticeable and striking. Number one, however, has an insignificant damaged annulus. Much like my specimen out here, it's not particularly striking. So that's something you have to be aware of and look out for. It is a very important special feature, but it might not always be present, or at least immediately noticeable. So, our death cap. Yellow, greeny, olivey pileus, crowded white lamellae, a skirty, floppy, wizard sleevey type of annulus, and a bulbous sac-like vulva. Those are the features that a death cap possesses. Eating this one cap would kill me. Half of this would kill me. That's all it takes. Let's say if Sean were to dice this up and conceal it amongst my pot of food. That would be my ticket out of here. That's GG, dead as a doorstop. The death cap is responsible for the overwhelming majority of fungi related deaths. It's also been the bane of several Roman emperors and popes. 
So it's got quite a few notches on the bedposts of victims. Very significant historical figures at that. Oi oi. Cheeky bracket fungus. From Fermentarius? No. This is what's known as Ganoderma aplanatum, otherwise known as the artist's conch. But this is where knowing the scientific names for fungi helps with identification. Aplanatum means flat, like a flat plane. Ganoderma aplanatum is a flat bracket, similar to Daedalaeopsis. Over the years, it will appear more bumpy and fat because every year a new flat fungus grows on top of the old one, like growth rings on trees, so to speak. But a young Ganoderma aplanatum will be flat. There are different species of Ganoderma that look similar, but knowing the etymology of the epithet aplanatum helps distinguish across species. Species ID absolutely does not matter with this genus of fungus. Edibility is never a concern. The reason this is called artist's conch is because the white underside of the fungus bruises, often a red, sometimes brownish colour. As such, it can be a medium for creativity. You can draw on it. This feature is not exclusive to Ganoderma aplanatum, however. Ganoderma astral shares this feature. Another reason why common names are a bit silly and encourage misidentification of species. Drawing on a Ganoderma astral does not share the common name artist's conch, though, but it possesses the defining characteristics of artist's conch. If I had it my way, I'd assign this the common name Crimson Planar Bruiser. Couldn't mistake that for anything else, I feel. The Ganodermas share similar physical characteristics to Fomfomentarius. Quite a fibrous, fluffy flesh. Very reminiscent of Fomfomentarius. The technical term for this part of the fungus is called the Trammer, just FYI. The trammer of Ganoderma is quite a vibrant red, a crimson colour. Fomfomentarius is more orange, to a dull brown. So Ganodermas are easy brackets to identify, and confusing it for Fomfomentarius shouldn't happen. But despite that, it doesn't really matter because this can be used as a tinder in the same way you'd use Fomfomentarius. A fantastic alternative, but it's not as good. It's great, but it's not spectacular. One problem is it tends to retain a lot of moisture. It's always a bit damp throughout unless it's been a really long dry spell. So using it fresh off the tree can be a bit tedious. Very frustrating at times. You need to drown it in close showers of sparks. Unlike Fomfomentarius that stays soft, dry, fluffy and pretty easy to ignite. It is a damn fine substitute though. But if you're unfamiliar with using tinder fungus then it's not as easy and foolproof as the horse's hoof. You can get an ember if you bathe it in sparks with a ferrocerium rod. But flint and steel can be tedious. Easy. Oh yeah, let's get some low angle on these bad boys. Coprinellus micaceus, glistening ink caps. These ink caps are edible in this stage. These are ink caps that do not contain coprin, so you can wash it down with some medicinal whiskey if you desire, but eventually blacken through deliquescence until they turn into these pretty ugly and cheerless things. Don't really want to eat these. Lycopodon pyriform, stump puffballs or pear puffballs. This is a gruesome state of affairs. Poor tree. It's got ink caps on it, it's got a bracket of some description on it, and some stump puffballs on it. You're in rough shape, bruh. This is an interesting ink cap. They're pretty ginormous. Magpie ink caps, because they have a bunch of white specks on them, like magpie plumage. One for sorrow, two for joy, three for a girl, four for a boy. What's five? Never got that far. Silver, I think. Silver! Well all right then. Oh look at that ink. Pretty grim things. Not edible ink caps though. These ink caps are poisonous. Purdy little fangs though. It's a day of lanky fungi. Like Opatum palatum at the end of its tether. Now we can make them really puff. Now I'll show you why they're called puff balls. Don't want to be too vigorous though, because it can cause respiratory issues. 
good way to give yourself lycopodinosis, which is a respiratory disease caused by inhaling puffball spores. Bad times. Dogs sometimes get lycopodinosis from shoving their nose in it and stirring them up. Oh damn! I feel like a magician in a cloud of smoke. And now, for my vanishing act. Had I stumbled across these earlier, well, that would have made one hell of a feast. These fungi are legitimate gourmet mushrooms sold in fancy restaurants and supermarkets too. These are oyster mushrooms, Pleurotus ostreatus held in incredibly high regard for their taste. One of the finer distinguished fungi. Frying them is the standard practice, but in a pinch you can boil them, you know, just to clean them. They're edible raw, but you never know if a squirrel's pissed on them or not. All white, although kind of an off-white. Darker hues on the top of the pileus. This is a highly variable species in respect to cap colour. Sometimes they're white, cream, sometimes they're dark grey, grey violet, grey brown, steel blue. Bit like turkey tails in that regard, but either way, smooth in texture. The gills are decurrent, meaning they curve downwards into the stem. If they have a visible stem, that is. Depends on the cut of their jib, but a cheeky nibble, indeed. A bullet. I mean, two minds about what this is though. It's either a variant of a deadly poisonous bullet, or it's an edible one. So it's best if I just refrain from giving an OTFI. Keep my gob shut on this one. But it is an interesting one because it is so vibrantly coloured and changes colour. It's like fungi built out of random ass Lego blocks. Allow me to showcase. The cap is a dull olive yellowy colour, similar to death cap colours. Although the lighting isn't doing me any favours right now, it's much more vibrant in person. It turns paler towards the margin, a creamy white. The underside of the pileus, rusty sort of reddish brown, with pores, which is what makes it a bullet. The tubes, those little tunnels that spores are produced in and travel down to be dispensed out of the pores, is a light yellow. But upon oxidising with the air, it will discolour into a greeny yellow, similar to sulphur tuff gills, eventually turning a greeny blue colour. And the flesh of the pileus is speckled, burgundy, maroony and white, which too will discolour greeny blue. The stipe, yellow and red. It's like those little sweets, rhubarb something. Rhubarb custards, I think one of those. Red and yellow. Some bullets will have like a lattice network on the stipe, like netting technical term for that is reticulations. This one does not have any reticulations. But the real kicker is that it bruises a bright intense blue. That big old blue smudge, that's from where I rammed my thumb in it. So let's do it again. Let's stain it. Pretty beautiful. I'm Myron. Oh, didn't mean to do that. But damn, watch it stain. Hypholoma fasciculaire, the sulfur tuft, the common toxic look-alike of Gymnopus confluens. Well, it's a common toxic look-alike of a lot of things, but we'll make reference to the familiar. Quite a rich orange and yellow hue paler towards the margin. Slight green tinge to the gills. Cap and stipe, very rounded, smooth and regular. All in all, it's a pretty aesthetically pleasing fungi. Not one to add to the snack bowl though. Mistaking it for anything else should not be an issue. Nothing else quite looks like the sulfur toft, with the exception of its brothers and sisters in the Hypholoma genus of fungi. Been on the prowl for Amanita muscaria. No luck today, but hey, at least I found it's brother, not going to leave empty handed. Either I've gone colour blind to the colour blue, or my skies have turned grey. Better not be the latter.
Otherwise, me and Mother Nature will be having some words. But over yonder, those yellow trees. Not typical deciduous trees losing their leaves. Oh no, those are large trees. Which is a unique tree in that it is considered both deciduous and coniferous. It's usually one or the other. Quick explanation for the unsavvy. Deciduous trees are those that lose their leaves in the fall. They become barren and bare in autumn. Broadleaf trees, oak, maple, trees of that nature. Coniferous trees are the needled cone-bearing trees, or the evergreens to simplify it. Pine, spruce, cedar. The needled trees that remain evergreen throughout the changing seasons. Larch has needles, and they are green most of the time but they turn yellow and fall in the autumn, like deciduous trees. It's a peculiar one, makes for a spectacular viewing. Bursts of yellow in an otherwise evergreen forest. Interestingly, larch has some historical significance. Back in the day, 1940s, Nazi Germany, doing their business. Some green-fingered fellows planted larch trees in the shape of a swastika, in the middle of a coniferous forest. And for a few weeks in the autumn, those larches would turn yellow and a bright and vibrant swastika would appear in the tree line. Symbolism aside, that's pretty cool. Gotta admire the horticulture. But this carefully arranged swastika of larch lasted several decades, as it could only be seen from air for a couple of weeks in autumn. It stood there until the 90s, and then they were eventually cut down. Suddenly, wind out of nowhere! Nice shot though, got the green and the yellow. Branches and leaves be flying. You know the saying, every cloud has a silver lining. That's fine, but it's annoying when your lovely silver cloud gets a black lining or a black smothering. Morbid aesthetics. Tubby bye bye. Oh crap! It's the feds! It's the government! How the moonshine leader come to take out there? Put us in the FEMA camps. Glad I got this shot. It's very metaphoric. It sums up my relationship with Mother Nature. A very long, drawn out, fuck you asshole. Look at the debris. Wind's picking up, man. Get hyped. Quite an abrupt end to basking in the autumn rays. Just wanted one last sunny campus fix before it's like this er day. C'est la vie. Bit windy millers out here, mate. <laughs> Just got smacked in the face by a high velocity leap. But compare this casual bit of wind to the hurricanes and tornadoes that Americans suffer regularly. By comparison, this is a walk in the park. Exciting. I like the contrast. <laughs> that misery can't put a damper on my day, no matter how monotone you make it. Wood shall be splintered on this day. Branches will fall on this day. Bad place to stand. It's like the anus of Mother Nature. She's like, about to shit all over you, boy. How dare you enjoy my bounty. I'm the harbinger of bad times. Don't you forget it. I am both the fun-loving girlfriend and the unbearable wife that will not stop moaning until you are just as miserable as she is. Such a bad place to be in a forest amongst all that wind. It's like, am I going to get crushed by a falling tree today? Am I going to be put in a coma by a falling branch? We've headed out of the tree line though, out of the forest, to play it safe. Because the threat of falling wood is real. Got our orange bivy sacks to crawl into in case it rains as well. Mother Nature, have some clemency. 